just one more word about a new bias academy it started last year during the first lockdown and we have actually around 25 webinars on our youtube channel we have an impressive number of registration and even more impressive number of views on youtube and we are really happy to see that it's uh, having this success and uh, today we are um, on, on the fifth webinar of this big data series we saw how to visualize images, how to register images and uh, do some quantitative analysis. And today we are going to, uh, dip, uh, to dig a bit more into uh, parallelization and also how to handle very, very large images. Um, so our speakers today are Pavel Tamanchak from Dresden and Stefan Zafel from Janilia. Uh, Pavel will speak around uh, half an hour and then Stefan will uh, take over for the last hour. So uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome Pavel and Stefan and Pavel, the floor is yours. Uh, I will uh, stop sharing and let you share your screen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, welcome everybody. I will uh, somehow hopefully ease you into the complicated uh, uh, topic of uh, exploring how to parallelize image analysis using uh, Fiji and uh, in particular in this case, uh, open MPI. So, um, my presentation will be uh, structured as, as follows. First, uh, we will look into why do we actually need to use HPC to do image analysis. Then we will discuss a little bit how uh, the efforts which we have made in the past to, to apply parallel processing to a very specific image analysis task. Then we will go a little bit more general and in detail about the principles of how we can really use ImageJ and Fiji to parallelize uh, relatively simple but very diverse image processing tasks or many small images. And then I will give you a glimpse of how one can use the more advanced image J2 in infrastructure to parallelize also processing on relatively large images, but maybe not, not so many. At the end, I will show you that it is possible to put it all together and in principle also work with many large images, but the, the, the realm of this kind of uh, a webinar, the really, really large images. This is what's going to be discussed by Stefan Salfeld after my presentation. So um, just that we are on the same page, one example of a big image data in biology is coming from light sheet ma microscopy. What you are watching here is the development of Drosophila embryo, which has been imaged with the size light sheet microscope from five angles. We collected all together 715 time points. We tortured this poor embryo for about 24 hours. At about this time, morphogenesis is almost uh, complete and you know, muscle systems are, are is connected to the nervous system and the embryo will start twitching. But we are still Im imaging it because we want to show that after 20 hours, this embryo will actually hatch into a larva. So the, from the point of view of image analysis, this generates lots of data, 4.1 terabytes of raw image data which is something you know, which is you know, hard to process by any means, right? Let's now wait for the embryo to hatch. And that's gonna happen about now. Okay, voila, happened, all right. So in order to get such a video, what we need to do is to do image processing on, on, on this data. We acquire it using either a commercial or open source microscope. Then we acquire in this case, so-called multi-view data, same specimen from different angles. So we have to register the data, which is the first step here. Then we have to combine the image stacks of the different angles together to one output, uh, almost isotropic stack, which might be deconvolved. So that's a very computationally demanding step. Then we have big data, which we need to visualize. We are using here as an example, a big data viewer from Fiji to do that and we might want to do some very diverse data analysis on this kind of data. So, um, you know, this basically really, this technology really highlights the big data challenge in biology. I mean, until recently we were using mostly confocal microscopy. This is a slide from Jan, Jan Husken. And we would, if we would image an embryo for 24 hours, we would 
generate 85 gigabytes of, of image data, but the embryo would be probably dead long before that. If we use a classical, let's say now, commercial available SPIM and we let it run for 24 hours, we generate five terabytes, which is difficult, right? If you use a state-of-the-art development optical table machine, it is not unusual that you generate in 24 hours 90 terabytes of image data. So the big data problem in microscopy is really big. Another way to cast this problem comes from the IT department of our institute where they say, well, I mean, you have maybe routinely, you, you plan to acquire 13 terabytes a day, but you are saying that you could also acquire 128 terabytes a day, right? So just please consider this is what our IT people said, that the combined production, a production of CERN is 82 terabytes, right? So if you want to do something like that, you have to invest some effort and some money into the, into the problem. So what one, what one basically does is to make this pipe of how you process, how you deal with such data in various ways into a much thicker one, right? I mean, instead of a single drive, you use a redundant array, you get a better ethernet connection. And instead of a single machine, you use something called HPC, high performance computing resource, which allows you to parallelize the processing. So that basically uh, means that you, you are, what we are in particular facing in the case of the light sheet microscopy data processing is that even though our individual time points might not be so large, maybe five gigabytes maximum, and it takes us minutes and hours to register and de deconvolve them, if we acquire thousands of time points, these minutes become very soon hours and the hours become, become days. And so then, you know, you know, having the solutions in open source software is a big advantage because with open source software, what we can easily do, we can parallelize such a task per time point and we can spread it over the cluster and we don't have to worry about anything in terms of licenses and paying for running the same software on many different nodes on a high performance, performance uh, computing resource. So that's, a, you know, one of the biggest, actually most convincing argument for using open source software pl pl platforms for doing image analysis on big data. So we implemented first this very specific solution for this particular task, right? It is schema sch schematized here. It is a very complicated scheme. What one should really point out here is that in such a pipeline, some parts are very easily so-called trivially par parallelizable. We can, we can uh, you know, change the format of the data for every file separately without affecting the other files. We can do registration also for all the images which are representing one time point and we can spread that each to, to one node of, of, of the cluster. However, we have to also at some point consolidate the data. For example, in the SPIM registration pipeline, we're doing so-called time-lapse stabilization, which means we have to collect everything together to the head node and do some processing, which requires interaction between the time points. And so one has to really develop a pipeline which is able to do all, all of that. So we actually did it, right? And uh, you know, now here, I will just very briefly jump to the wiki page, which describes how one can do it, right? And you know, I named the title, the command line rules, right? So, so actually, if you are a geek, this is fun, right? You play a cluster like a piano, right? You have all this you know, huge amount of stuff which you have to read through you know, many commands, many little scripts, you are on the command line, you are actually really sending jobs to the cluster, you are editing text files, you know, it's really, really fun, right? But it is complex, right? I mean, I'm still scrolling, essentially, hope you are see, seeing this, right? It's very well documented, but it is not easy to use. That's very, very clear. Okay, so we address this by trying to make this kind of solution more e easy to use. And this is something which we do in co cooperation with the uh, with experts, with people which, which are running a supercomputing cluster in Ostrava in Czech, Czech Republic at the at the at the project at the academic project which is called IT for e e e Innovation. They have a you know several large clusters in there. They have this wonderful name like Anselm, Salomon, Barbara, and the most recent one which is called Carolina. Absolutely beautiful names. Okay, so what, what we do here is that we are on our local uh, computer inside Fiji. We upload the data to this remote cluster, which is in Ostrava. It submits the job, it does the processing. 
we can influence what, how the processing is going to be done through a single, sim, not, not simple, but single configuration file, which lives on our file system locally. We can change it and we can resubmit the job and try to run it again on the cluster, right? All that is happening from within Fiji and we can examine the results, whether the cluster did what we wanted, whether it registered data, also from our local Fiji by looking at the data which are still in Ostrava through the big data viewer. At the end of the process, we download it, right? So this is simpler than what I showed you before. In fact, it's so simple that it's a graphical user interface. There is a so-called HPC workflow manager, manager plugin, which you find in the Fiji menu if you install the uh, appropriate update site. And you really can submit the job to the Ostrava cluster from within such nice graphical user e in interface. And even you can monitor how your job is proceeding, right? Because I, as a biologist, I find it always super annoying if a computer scientist says, okay, so now I submitted it to the cluster and then I'll wait a day, right? And then it will be done, right? But I don't, you don't even know that the cluster is doing something, right? So it's, it's very important for us biologists who are using this to have some visual feedback that processing is happening. Besides the fact that it's actually really kind of uh, nice to watch, you know, to see how a computer somewhere, you know, in another country is kind of churning on your, on your data. So we developed all this, the ability to submit such a very specialized job to the cluster and to monitor how it progresses. And it is published if you want. And if you want to look at how it works, you know, we have a pretty decent documentation for all of this. But disadvantages, it has many disadvantages. First of all, you know, as of now, it only works in the cluster in Ostrava, which is actually meant to provide service to the scientific community. But believe me, it is not exactly straightforward to gain access to a supercomputer because there is there are massive security issues and there are many hoops through which you have to jump. Okay, maybe you have a cluster in your local place. And in fact, you can install the system which we developed also somewhere else. We did that in our cluster in Dresden, but this is not simple. And the other thing which has a big disadvantage of this is that this is a very specific solution for a very specific task, right? I mean, this parallelizes the SPIM pipeline and it doesn't parallelize anything else, right? So for the, in the rest of my talk, I will try to show you how we are kind of on the way to develop solutions which address this kind of problems. And so the solution which we came up with is to build a bridge, to build a bridge between Fiji, open source software for biological image analysis and something which is called open MPI. Open MPI is a bona fide standard for parallelization of software of code on an HPC resource. It is something, it is a program which you will find on any HPC cluster, no matter how obscure it is, it is really uh, a standard, right? And so we built this bridge in two different ways. We built it first as uh, a bridge which is built around ImageJ macro. This is something which is really targeting biology users who know how to play with macros and we simply provide them with a relatively simple way with a few new syntactic elements to parallelize an existing or newly recorded uh, macro. And here you, you user, you are deciding how the task is going to be parallelized. You are in the driver's seat, you decide which node does essentially what. And this is really suitable if you have a directory of 25,000 images each one of them is not so big, but if you would do it serially, it would take forever. You know, here you can really batch it into groups of let's say thousand and run it on the cluster. Now the second bridge is more, more complex. It is building on the more advanced infrastructure of ImageJ2. And it is building a bridge between the open MPI, which is the cluster software and the ImageJ ops. This is something which is targeting more experienced developers who can actually deal with the ops. The, the beauty of this is that, as you will see, it creates no new syntax. So if you have an op and you use our new version of that op and you have a connection to OpenAI enabled cluster, without changing a single line of code, your code will run in parallel on, on the cluster. So this is fantastic for uh, automation. And it is targeting the second big task, which is if you want to process on a very large image, which you simply, you know, which is not so easily quantized into pieces. So now you are basically giving the task of spreading the processing of such image to the open MPI, which is very clever in its way, how it will, it will distribute it over the avail available resource. So here 
you as user, you are not in the dri driver's seat at all. You are relying on the software to do the right thing. Okay, so now it is shown here, let's say one more time graphically. We have many small images on our local uh, computer. We have access to a supercomputer, we upload it and we say, process those two images on, on node one and those two images on node two and those two images on node three and download the results, very simple. The second way is a script, which is gonna be a Jiton script able to include the image J ops commands. And once again, you have a one large image which you upload to the cluster and the, and the program itself splits the task into appropriate pieces so that the three computer nodes which are available are maximally used and you download the data, right? Okay, so that's kind of high level overview. Now I will show you how this simple parallelization actually works because it is um, you know, highly unintuitive, but once you get it, you, I guarantee you that you can do it. So how does open MPI parallelization actually work? This is a cluster, which is computer consisting of many uh, other many small, big computer consisting of many smaller uh, computers, which are called nodes. And usually you don't get access to all of it, right? So for example, here, uh, whenever there is the Fiji logo, this is uh, the nodes which are available for our specific task. Now, in order to understand open a a MPI, you have to understand that each one of these computer nodes are going to run the same macro, the same code, right? And this macro will have access to two numbers which are originating not from uh, the parameter which you put in, but which are originated from the open MPI, from the cluster itself. The one number is gonna be a constant, which will tell you how many of those nodes are available to you, how many you can use, right? And the other one, which is the get the, 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 the which, which is the rank, is a, is a number which is gonna be different on every one of the computer which where the, where the macro runs. So if the macro runs on this computer here and it asks for par get rank, it will get a number which is zero. But if the same very same macro runs on another computer, it will get another number. It will have number which is two, which is one and two and three on this one. They all will know that they have 11 in, in total. This is super simple. But this is all you need to know in order to parallelize image J macros. So let's see how it's done, right? So you, you record and, or you can write or whatever, you use the existing macro as you have it. And now you, we will, I will show you, I mean, I will not really show, sh show you, but I will give you an impression of how you can kind of insert very small syntax into your existing macro to make it parallel. And then I will show you how it, uh, you can do a little bit more complicated thing. Okay, and then, sorry, you insert the syntax to make it uh, parallel. And then if you are running this on a computer which is configured to connect to a cluster which runs OpenMPI, this macro will distribute across the cluster. What is a little bit more co com complicated and which I will try to show you as well is that you could also insert a little bit of syntax to provide the monitoring that something is happening, that your processes are actually uh, progressing and you can really decide at what pace you want to have this kind of monitoring or you just don't do it at all and trust that the cluster is gonna do what you ask it to, which is a kind of tall order sometimes. Okay, so now let's see. Now we have here 10 images which are numbered zero to nine and we have only one computer to, to process all on them. So we will probably process, we will do some, we will have some code which has a function inside, which loads the image, does something to it and stores it, right? This is, this is what we are doing, right? This is in the macro. Now, in order to, to, to apply it to the 10 images, we put it in a loop, right? This is very easy. We iterate from zero to nine and we make this function run for each one of those images, right? So on this computer, which this computer is a, is a, is a, is a cluster with single node, the node is zero. Basically, it will process on the first image, second, third, and so on. So it will serially process across the images. This is the default thing, no cluster, single computer. Now let's imagine that we have a cluster which has four nodes. They are numbered zero, one, two, and three, right? So now I will try to remind you that we had two numbers available to us. One of them is the number of nodes available to us, which is four, and the other one is the one number of each node, which only the node actually knows, right? 
Okay, so we will have the same function to do the work. And now we will change, uh, well, the only thing which we will change in our pseudo code program is what is inside the loop, right? We start with, uh, with the number which the node gives us and we end with the, and we end with a, and we, and, we, and we increment the loop by the number of the size of our cluster. So what does it mean, right? If I am on the node number zero, and then we have to put this inside a little syntax, syntactic sugar, which is initializing this parallel, let's say, let's say processing, but this is a detail. So if I now am on the node zero and I get this image, my parget rank will be zero and I will initiate this loop on the, on the image zero, right? When I, when I visit this loop one more time, I will increment by target size, but by plus four. So the next time I run the loop, I will do work on the image number four. And next time I will run on an image no number eight. This is now not, nothing special, right? But the, but the magic comes here, right? If I am not on node number zero, I'm on the node number one, my, my par get rank returns one, which means that I will be actually working on this image and then this image and then, then this image. And like this, I can in parallel work on the 10 images, right? So that's uh, basically the principle of how to deploy the open API parallelization using ImageJ macro. Now, it would be of course nice to see that it's happening and you can actually be implemented ways how you can visualize the progress of just such computation in a beautiful way like it's shown, shown here. Okay, now we, our pseudocode will become a little bit more, more complex. This part here is the same. We have a new, new set here, which basically repeats this loop and creates a task for every image which we generated. And then inside our function, we put a little uh, syntactic elements, which tell us, you know, the code proceeded until here, the code proceeded uh, until here, right? And using those two things, you can basically monitor how on a given image where your program is and it can report it to this graphical element which will display it in this way, right? It is very simple, it doesn't have to be done, but it makes it a little bit more accessible. Okay, so if you want to use it and if you want to find out more, then please go to this uh, web page. I will go there very briefly. I think I will actually manage to finish more or less on, on time. So this is a very nice guide which was done for the I2K conference, you really can start uh, this, uh, you know, the basic uh, prerequisite, then you click next, then you get really nice screenshots, how to get to the plugin, how to set up your cluster, how to connect to it, all this stuff, and you continue, right? So this is a very, very nice tutorial, which obviously I couldn't cover here, but, uh, but you know, look, look it up, you know, you can jump between the different places. You also learn how to write the macro, you, you know, this example, which I showed here graphically, it's shown here on another, let's say, example. One should actually, maybe maybe we don't have that much time, but one should actually say that, you know, there are many other ways how to use those two numbers, the size of the cluster and the rank of the node to parallelize, right? You can, you can group your data in whatever way you want, you just do it inside your macro and you are deciding how to do it. You know, once you've wrapped your head around it, it's very simple. Okay, but now let's come back to the second, second example, right? What if we actually, don't have such a sim simple, simply that parallelizable, trivially parallelizable task where we have many small images and we can just you know, put them in groups and send them to the nodes, right? What if we, we have a one large image which we have to actually split? So here we have to do something a little bit more, um, let's say ad advanced, which is a library which was developed by the great people in Ostrava, SciJava Parallel uh, MPI, which builds the bridge to open API on a much deeper level of image day two ops. Right, so this basically takes care of splitting the problem into chunks. It, uh, you know, this is really using the open API in its full, let's say, a power, meaning that the nodes, they know about each other, they can communicate with one another. But however, you know, if you would want to do it in open M MPI, the code is behind, it's complicated, it's really difficult, right? So now this completely abstracts it. I think that the computer science people like to say that it's fully, fully transparent, but I'm not 100% sure, right? You know, you as biologists, you will not need to write any MPI related code. We have developed a new version of the ImageJ ops and their syntax will not change. I will show you that. You know? Eventually when it's completely finished, it will be available through an update site and hopefully it will become actually useful. Right now it's still a kind of experimental thing. 
So what does it do? How, how does it work, right? We have a large image. Okay, this doesn't maybe look very large, but this is an example. It's an image which contains nine planes, right? And we have a computer which, you know, now the, the, the open MPI makes all decisions. Let's say it gets a computer which has only eight nodes, right? So it will divide that image, these nine planes into eight chunks. What you can see is that the chunk number one, it doesn't correspond to the plane. It, it extends to the next plane, right? Because for the computer, for the open MPI, this is like a chunk of data, which it needs to divide among the resources which it has. So it creates these eight chunks, then it processes on them using also multi-threading inside, it doesn't really matter. And then when it does one processing step, it resynchronizes, it sends all the other nodes, the data, which the other nodes have been uh, computing on, right? So this is a necessary step, which is using the inter-process communication. And, you know, it makes it more powerful because you don't really have to do any decisions how to split it. It can do it completely automatically, but it introduces an overhead because the time it takes to synchronize the data across the cluster increases with the number of cluster nodes. If you have only one node, there's obviously nothing. If you have a few, it's not so long, but if you have 30 nodes, if they all have to receive the copy of, 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 of the data, it can take some seconds, right? So this is one overhead and I will get to the limitations of it in a, in a moment. But I find this absolute beauty of this approach is that now we are doing a difference of Gaussian on a, let's say a large image. We are using it using Jiton using the ImageJ2 ops, right? You don't have to understand this, this code. We open a data set, you do the convolution with one kernel, you do the convolution with the other, other kernel, we subtract them and we save, save the data. The beauty of it is that if this would be done on a single com uh, computer, the code would be identical. There would be not a single line or, or whatever character uh, different, but because we are running it on a computer which is set up for a cluster access, it gets internally on that computer split into the free nodes which are available and it will run hopefully faster, you know, given the overhead which is e in introduced here. Okay, so that basically means that, you know, this is something which is still rather uh, experimental, but if you want to find out more, it is already documented. It is, on, it, it, is, it is on GitHub and I encourage everyone to give it a try because we need people to basically beta test it, right? Now, Last point, you know, could we actually combine the two, the, the two uh, approaches? Could we operate on many large images, right? So the answer to that is in principle, yes, the hybrid approach of macro and ops is very much possible. Sorry, this is a little bit busy slide. I mean, what you should take as a take home message here that here inside the code, whatever is blue is macro, okay? One has to say that this is macro, which has been wrapped up into Jiton because you have to be in Jiton to be able to use the ops, right? And then whatever is red is ops, right? So you can, you, can, you can divide and conquer your task with the macro commands when you decide how you divide it. Let's say you take this large image and send it to those four, four nodes and this large image and send this to those, those four nodes and this large image and send it to those. This is actually automatic, you just set it, right? And then inside it will split it using the ops and operate in parallel on this large, large image, right? One has to say, I think I have it here in the corner. I always move your picture so that I can see. Yeah, this is under cons construction. This is not really working yet entirely. It's a proof of principle. We hope this will work. And we are finding out the ways, you know, how to figure out when in what scenario, this is a good approach that given the overheads, which it has, that it actually works. So this is, leads me to my last slide, right? So there is, of course, you know, some, some gotchas, right? One is, I already mentioned that the synchronization makes it slower. The second gotcha is that your data set cannot be infinitely large because at some point in the pipeline, it has to fit in the memory on one, on, of one cluster node. So it keeps, gives a very, very hard ceiling to how big your data can be depending on what cluster you are at. These clusters usually have a lot of memory. So it's not such a, impractical thing, right? But on a very large data sets, you simply, you know, cannot do it, right? You can either do something else ahead of time to divide the big data set into smaller pieces, or you stay tuned and uh, listen to Stefan Salfeld, who will show you how they do this kind of magic at Janelia. So what I showed you was, let's say, you know, more developmental stuff, more practical, on the type of data which you know many of us might encounter. And I think the take home message here is that there are now ways how to do it on a very specific data sets for SPIM registration, 
There are ways how to parallelize your macros with uh, injecting very little new syntax where you are in charge and you can parallelize whichever way you want. And there is also a way how to use the awesome power of open MPI to parallelize automatically using the image ops, but you have to be a, a programmer to make to take advantage of, of that. This is a product of the hard work of the team, which I established a couple of years ago in Ostrava, which is the supercomputing cluster in Czech Republic. And you know, there are pictures of all those people and their names. I mean, they have been really instrumental. And Vlado, Vladimir Ulman is in the background answering uh, your questions about this. I went uh, over time almost not at all. So I am kind of reasonably proud of myself. And uh, I am uh, you know, either going to answer some questions, or I will pass the baton to Stefan Salfeld, who will go talk about the really big data. Okay, thank you, Pavel. I, I, I will give like a few minutes. Uh, I, I will allow a few minutes of questions for you. Um, there, there, there was a question uh, about uh, memory limitation, and this was answered by Vladimir. Actually, there is no memory limitation because we are on the cluster, so it, it, the limits is the limits of the cluster. But I think related to that, the question was also how to retrieve the information you, you process, the, the, the results you process right. uh, from the server. And I yep. think like loading the data is also an issue. Very good point, very, very, very good point. So, so I would like to say that we addressed it. I mean, I, it's more like that we are in the process of addressing it. Uh, in our grant, one of the work packages have been to figure out you know, how to push the data to the cluster. Obviously, there are some physical limits to it, right? I mean, you know, in our experience, you know, typically we are actually, most of us are living on a backbone of the academic network and our syncing data to the cluster is actually not so prohibitive, right? But sometimes the problem is that a cl cluster might not necessarily have a massive storage capacity, right? So especially in Ostrava, actually, it's been always difficult to find, you know, enough storage for big data to sit there for a while, right? You know, there are ways how one can, you know, think about parallelizing the, the transfer of the data or you and or using a compression and we are actually exploring those, but there's nothing really concrete to show yet for, for this. I would say last thing to say to this, I mean, the amount of effort to set it up is still significant, right? I mean, getting access to the cluster and figuring out that it works and all that, the time you spend on that is probably gonna be longer than it, the time it takes to copy your data there. So yeah. it's not such a prohibitive thing. Yeah. Okay. And I, I would have a second question. So if uh, uh, for from a facility point of view, if there is uh, like, an, I mean, an image facility point of view, if uh, there is not yet um, an infrastructure, like a real cluster, uh, how do you go to the IT service? How do you mm -hmm. uh, start this process? Um, because I, so from what I understood, OpenMPI is a, a software, mm -hmm. but it's probably not available everywhere. You have to. Is, no, this will be available everywhere. That is not a, that is not really the show showstopper. You know, any cluster will have it, right? Okay, so so it can it, be installed on it. I mean, it's not it's open source, right? It's not. Okay, it's so not, so there there. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, you know, that there, there is a, of, of course, so if you, if you, if you do have a cluster, there is a, some kind of expertise required to set it all up. Yeah. In fact, some of the links, which I showed during the presentation to the Wiki are making an attempt at explaining this, right. But, but the person with the IT experience is definitely required to do that, right. If you are using something which is maybe commercial a little bit, right. Uh, okay. So, you know, Nowadays, you would probably think more about the cloud services, but we are talking here about connecting to a academic HPC resource, which is available to the outside world, right? So there will be, as I said, many hoops you have to jump through initially to gain uh, account on that cluster, right? And, you know, sometimes it could be kind of uh, formidable, but, you know, the question is, you know, it might be worth it considering that, let's say, I mean, to some degree, the infrastructure then to eventually run there exists, right? So, mm. uh, you know, it's not without its, its uh, issues because of course, security is a massive, massive point for these HPC re resources. They are constantly being bombarded by hackers, right? 
So you really have to make you know proper you know handshakes and stuff like that, and and it's not penetrable, right? But nevertheless, you know it can be done. Okay. So yeah. Um, Vladimir, do you see one question that would be still interesting? I don't want to go too much over time, but because we. Um, we have a bunch of really technical questions. Um, Those are not for me. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would prefer to have Vladimir and John answering them by writing and then uh, uh, give the floor to Stefan so that we don't yeah. go too much over time. Okay. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. This was very enjoyable talking thank about you, Pavel. Kind of geeky stuff from my, from my living room. Excellent. Hey, thanks so much, guys. Um, yeah, as a as a proud Pavel alumni, it's uh, really a pleasure to present in this um, Tomancha Club um, session on new bias, and I'm very thankful for this. Um, it's really cool. Um, in in this seminar. Um, I want to I want to give you a hands-on demonstration of the toolbox that we um, use to develop and apply processing pipelines for um, relatively large image data sets and um, large is a relative term so we'll, we'll talk about um, concrete numbers later. Um, keep you should keep in mind when you hear this presentation um, that that this is our personal perspective this is maybe not the right answer for everybody um, of what a good framework for large data processing um, should look like and of course, this personal perspective is heavily biased by the fact that we develop many of these libraries and tools um, ourselves, and we have been using them for several years and we're kind of happy with that. So I want to share this happiness with you. I want to show you how to use these things um, and, and you, you will have to decide um, whether this is, this is for you or, or, or not. Um, first, I want to show you a few examples of the data sets that we have been working with. To, together with um, Khaled and um, um, folks from, from um, Jamelia Scientific Computing, um, and, and in particular Eric Trotman, we stitched and aligned the first and so far only complete Drosophila brain imaged with electron microscopy. This data set comprises um, 7,040 nanometer sections, each consisting of up to 2,000 overlapping tiles imaged at 4 nanometer lateral resolution with custom transmission electron um, microscopes developed by Davi Bock and, and, and his team who, who spearheaded this, this fabulous project. The size of this data set is um, somewhere between 50 and uh, 100 um, um, useful teravoxels. There's a little bit of overhead. And if you consider the, the, the background pixels as, as, as real data, then you end up a little bit um, above the 100 um, um, terabyte range. So that's, that's the data size that we're, that we're mostly dealing with. So let's look at another data set um, to get together with uh, Janilia Fellow, then Janilia uh, Fellow Dagmar Kainmiller. She's now a group leader in um, uh, Berlin. Uh, and our colleagues from Scientific Computing, we developed the methods to stitch and align a volume of the Tosophila central brain that was imaged with focused ion beam scanning um, at eight nanometer isotropic resolution. After it was sectioned into 13 slabs of um, 20 nanometer thickness, that's the, um, the, the stripes that you've seen here. And here we had to stitch and align the Fibesi M slabs and then unwarp and align the slab series. The size of, the data, of this data set is um, about in the same range um, as the um, serial section transmission EM data set that you've seen before. Um, however, the resolution here is isotropic, so reconstruction of neurons and synapses is a little bit easier than with, uh, um, with a non isotropic resolution that you've seen before. Um, the last example that I want to show you um, is this one. Um, we developed the code to stitch tens of thousands of 3D tiles um, imaged with lattice light sheet microscopy by um, Eric Betzig and, and, and his, his people. Um, this includes a method to estimate and correct the flat field of the imaging system from all tiles. The advantage in this, in this case is that we have, um, that we have so many tiles, um, but unfortunately no flat field image um, that we can reason um, the, the flat field from, from the Three details. This is this has been published before by um, Kevin Smith and, and, and colleagues, um, but was only implemented for two D images that fit into main memory. Here we have we, we have like 10, 10 to thirty um, um, 
terabytes of, of image data. We want to use all the pixels to estimate these wide field. Um, so this was the last video. Here's an example of what we do then when we, when we already have this data assembled. assembled um, we have worked on correlating light and electron microscopy. As you can see here, you can see an unbiased um, average atlas of the Drosophila brain and ventral nerve cord that we created from 60 symmetric uh, brain samples labeled with a generic synapse marker and imaged at 0.2 times 0.5 micrometer resolution with confocal laser scanning microscopy. Um, Larissa in the lab then trained a, a new uh, deep um, neural network to predict all the synaptic clefts in the TM volume that you see here at the bottom shown earlier. This, the, the, this was the first example and automatically registered the resulting synapse cloud. This is what you see here at the, at the top with the light microscopy atlas. Um, and now, thanks to the Drosophila brain being highly stereotypical, genetically labeled neurons in light microscopy can be associated with reconstructed um, neurons in electron microscopy. We've done that also for the um, other brain samples. And more recently, um, a, a new sample came in of the um, entire ventral nerve cord. And we also um, established a registration between um, these two samples. Um, the registration work is uh, worked by John Bogovic, who's actually answering um, 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 questions in this, in this session. All right, the library that we're using for most of these things um, is our uh, beloved image, uh, uh, image processing library, um, ImageLib2. ImageLib2 is not necessarily an image processing library, um, but a, a data management layer. And the, the, the thing that we like most about ImageLib2 is the fact that it is lazy. So what does it mean that ImageLib2 is lazy? ImageLib2 is lazy at several layers. Um, first of all, um, it, so basically, what so we should start at a different point. So ImageLib2 tries to express um, all mappings from discrete and continuous coordinate spaces into arbitrary pixel domains. So this means we come from n-dimensional vectors that are either on a grid, that's the discrete space, or in a continuous domain, that would be real space, real functions. Um, and we map into, into pixels whose type we don't know yet. These pixels in the classic sense could be 8-bit uh, um, numbers, 16-bit numbers, 32-bit numbers, uh, floating point or, or um, integers or something like this. But a pixel can also be an image, or a pixel can be a data set somewhere sitting on the cloud, right? And the only thing that you need to, to, to do is to um, implement logic that you then apply to these, to these, to these pixels. But when I'm talking pixel in the, in the follow-up of this talk, it's not always numbers. It can be all sorts of things. And they're abstracted through um, ImageLib2 interfaces that you use to, to, um, to talk to them. OK, so what does lazy coordinate access give us? Um, first of all, yes, we have discrete and continuous coordinates. This is wonderful. Um, we do not um, only randomly access coordinates, which would be the classic image processing uh, way of doing things. So I'm saying I go to pixel x, comma y, and then I'm reading it and stuff like this. But oftentimes, you just want to loop over all pixels. Um, there will be iteration. Or you have a data set that is on a regular grid, um, like when an when a, um, oceanographic uh, research um, endeavor uh, runs with a ship over the ocean and makes samples at um, various GPS coordinates and, and stores the samples with the GPS coordinates, that will be an irregular data set, right? And you want to be able to identify the samples or interpolate between the samples. So ImageLib2 gives you, gives you means to this um, by, by using uh, neighbor search or um, radio search and stuff like this. <clears throat> and also you have random access. Again, uh, random access in the discrete domain would be on a pixel grid, um, rectangle, some, some sort of rectangular pixel grid. Um, if you have this in the continuous domain, you can access arbitrary points. Okay. So in addition to this, we have coordinate transformations that include simple things like translations, flips, crops, um, boundary extensions that are virtually calculated uh, where no, no data exists. Um, and we can also rotate, um, interpolate, project, add dimensions, or um, remove dimensions from the data set, or even arbitrarily warp um, to, to do um, things like registrations between EM and like microscopy data sets. Okay. So the next thing is um, lazy 
value access to the pixels. So I mentioned before, pixels aren't always numbers, but most of the time they are. Um, what that, what that, um, so, so that's the co-domain of our of, of our functional space, right? We go from from um, from coordinate space um, into a, from from some Euclidean coordinate space into into an, an arbitrary pixel codomain. Um, the standard way to do this for any normal image processing thing would be accessing memory. Um, the advantage is that because um, image image lib two um, has virtualizes this, you can access um, shared memory of other processes and stuff like this. But you can also generate these pixel values depending on the coordinates. So you can implement functions. <clears throat> if you have an underlying image and you want to change um, what the what the values do, you can um, implement converters. So you can have functions that, that um, apply gamma corrections or change the pixel type or apply lookup tables or do, do other things with, with, with pixels. Um, you can have uh, multivariate functions where you combine several inputs into a new output, which is kind of the same as a generator because you don't really need to know what the inputs are, right? And of course, you can implement interpolators. Um, trivial things would be interpolators of pixels that can multiply and add, so they can implement um, things like um, n linear interpolation or Lankos interpolation or, or bicubics and stuff like this, or spline interpolations. Um, but it's also possible to interpolate between images, which we recently did to um, unshear um, spin recordings, um, because you shift these things um, in, in, um, up under arbitrary deformation. You, you know that these pixels have a numeric type, and they can um, generate a virtual interpolated image between them. Okay. So last but not least, um, we have lazy data access. So even if ImageLib2 accesses underlying um, chunks of uh, continuous memory to represent the data, um, this data can be generated um, lazily by cell loaders or um, array loaders. <clears throat> and these cell loaders and array loaders can be used to implement caches um, that go either through main memory or uh, come from permanent storage like a disk or, or, or a cloud store. Okay, so this is a lot of words and it's not fun to read all these words. So this is the place where I would like to um, go into the um, first um, examples. And for this, I need to change the way how I am um, sharing my screen. I go to full screen and that hopefully works. So we have here um, Eclipse, um, the integrated um, um, development environment that I, that I favor um, these days. And um, what you see here is a, is a repository full of examples um, that, I, that I want to use to guide you through this. So these examples are modified versions of, um, of a similar or, or a kind of related tutorial that we did at the I2K 2020 conference. And um, I posted the link to this repository in the chat. So that's a branch of this um, I2K um, advanced, um, advanced tutorial. So let's first go into ImageLib 2.1 tutorial. Um, we could start with loading an image and showing it to you, but um, everybody can do this. So what we start with is instead of um, using an image that lives in main memory, we will create one from pixel coordinates. So what we use is this thing here that is called a function real random accessible. <clears throat> Things in ImageLib2 have very long names that are descriptive um, for, for what, they're, what they're providing to you. So if something um, is able to implement random access in an n-dimensional real valued coordinate space, then it is a real random accessible. And you see this, um, this word here. And this particular one implements functions. So how do we do this? Um, we call this function a Julia set. This is the pixel type, the output type that we want to generate. Um, and this constructor has a few parameters. First one is the number of dimensions. So this is a simple case where we just say this is a two-dimensional function. <clears throat> and now we implement the function and we're using um, Java 8 features because they're cool. Um, this is a, a, a lambda, a byte consumer that gets two input uh, parameters. The first one is x, and the second one is f of x, because we're, we're overwriting it. This is the way how it's used, right? Um, x is an image lib2 type that is called real localizable. That means nothing else but that it is a vector 
um, that has real valued coordinates, okay? And f of x is of our output type. When I'm hovering here, you see that this is supposed to be an integer type. And so now let's see what we're doing here. Here we implement a function that does some magic, gets the coordinates of this x value, uh, writes the coordinate at dimension zero into c, and the coordinate at dimension one into d, and then it does some stuff, and it actually calculates the Julia fractal, right? And then once it's done and it found the iteration def at this particular pixel, it sets this uh, value that it found to f of x, which is an int type, okay? And we also have to provide an int type that the function has, a, has, a, has an object to, to, to operate with, okay? Um, this is the function, that's great. And now we're using um, the big data viewer, which is a, a, a project spearheaded by Tobias Peach, also at um lab, um, alumni or, or still present, so that is as a collaborator at least. And um, this has a lot of convenience functions. Um, the most important um, convenience functions is that you can display everything image lib2 with it very quickly by just using this BDF functions, um, 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 static, static function collection. Here we display this Julia set. We create some sort of interval that Big Data Viewer knows uh, where to paint a box. And we give it a name. And then we can provide some options. In this case, the options are that it is a 2D data set, so it doesn't have to do any 3D magic. And um, we want to use a display range from 0 to 64, because that's the limit of our Julia fractal. So it's not going to be brighter than 64, OK? So now let's um, run this. And for this one, I press the Run button. <clears throat> and here we see a big data viewer window pop up. We can rotate this, so this is cool. Um, and we can shift it around, and we can also zoom in. And I'm using the keyboard to zoom in. So, and one of the nice features in this example is that this is a function definition on a real valued space, input space. So there are no pixels. Um, this goes on and on forever until at some point uh, we reach the precision limit of double values. Let me see if we can reach that. Actually takes a while. So here we go. So this is, this is, um, this is the precision limit of, of, of double values. Um, but to show you how cool this is, we can also zoom out from here. And if you want higher precision, you can certainly um, change your your input space into something else. And okay, okay, good. So that's great. Um, what else um, can we do with this? Um, here we have the second example. We do exactly the same thing. We have our function random accessible, and we show this, and then we do something else lazy. We say raster this thing. Okay, so there is no memory imprint of this. It just rasters it, and then we show the raster image. And before it gets too complicated, let me let me show you this. Here we go. This is the original. Um, this is the original image, and then you see this. So this, yeah, exactly. So we're showing only a single source. And we show currently source number one. That's the thing that you've seen before. And now if we go to source number two, oops, what happened? Well, the Julia uh, fractal and the space in which we display this goes from minus one to plus one. So the resolution of the rastered image that we generated from this is three by three. That's a surprise, right? So how can we fix this? Kind of easy. So we could say we um, um, change the um, scaling here, and then we change the interval here, and stuff running and we show this again and either oh yes so what I didn't do is I did not change the interval of that function so I should probably also do this so the bit of your nose what 
we have been after. So this is the, the, the um, original function. And then if I go to source number two, you see this is also bounded because we, um, we, we cropped it um, virtually and generated this, 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 this bounded thing. So now if I zoom in, I would expect to see some pixels at some point. And that is actually true. Here the pixel are, here are the pixels. If we rotate them, we see that they are little squares. And if we switch on interpolation, uh, we can do this here. We'll see, okay, we can also interpolate them. So something that you may not see because zoom is a little bit slow in transmitting uh, emitting the, the signal is that this gets a little bit slow when I'm going full screen. <clears throat> and the odd thing that is happening right now computationally is that this rastered image is generated on the fly from the real valued function. So every pixel access um, asks the real valued function um, for a value. Uh, rasters it. And then if we do interpolation on top of this, for every pixel that we're rendering here on the screen, we actually ask the real valued function for four values, which is which is computationally more expensive than doing the original, which is this guy here. Okay. So that's a bit odd. Um, how can we fix this? Uh, we see this in tutorial number three. We start the same way. We have our function. Um, we show our function. I changed uh, the um, intervals here. Right? Um, and then we do this little trick here. From this interval that we rastered, we create a cached instance and we use a, a cached cell image with a block size of 32 by 32. This doesn't matter too much how big this is. And then we show this. And you can see everything else remains um, precisely the same. Right? So we can. Uh, run that, and we see, okay, this is the um, original function, and then source number two is the on-the-fly pixel rastered thing, and source number three looks exactly the same as source number two, but it's the cached version, and the cached version is significantly quicker because what this um, image lib 2 cache is doing is it um, takes the original source, um, it looks for little blocks that are stored in main memory, and it fills them once with values and then keeps them in main memory. Um, but it does it only as long as you have enough main memory. Otherwise, things are getting lost again and will be reloaded as you need them again. So for zooming deep into this area, um, all the stuff that is outside of this field of view is, is, is basically irrelevant and you, and you don't need it anymore. And um, and so you can you can have these 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 speed improved situations where you can use um, intermediate um, caching um, to 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 save compute time. Right? Okay. So the last thing that I want to show you um, in this image the two tutorial is um, lazy evaluation of um, on on top of on top of these data sets, so we've now have seen that we can create functions, we can raster them, and the coordinate access is, is transparent. We can cache things uh, into into main memory. So now we want to do something to the pixels, and what we're doing here is is we create on the fly calculated gradients from these um, input images. Um, one thing that we do first is we convert our um, raster data set into um, a new type because gradients are sometimes negative and we cannot only deal with positive numbers. But before that, we had some uh, a data type that um, actually used in types so that should have worked. Anyways, double is better. Um, so this is how it works. It's an on-the-fly conversion of every pixel value using, again, a by consumer that takes an input value and an output value, and it sets the uh, real value of the output value to the real value of the input value. And then it doesn't matter what the input and output values are. Um, and you, you use it double time. So calculating it doubles is cool. Um, now I have a helper function here. I create another random accessible interval that is um, um, undistinguishable in image lib2 from, from, from memory back thing, um, even if it's calculated on the fly, um, using this helper function that creates a, a gradient at dimension zero from this value. And let's look at how this function is implemented. It's actually relatively simple. Um, it well, it forwards to this function here. Um, and here we make an array of offsets. 
that is as long as all our dimensions and we set the um, offset dimension at the uh, dimension where I want to calculate the gradient to minus one. And then we create two virtual sources that are virtually translated, one in the inverse direction and one in the positive direction. So one of the images shifted here and one of the images shifted there, no memory duplication. They're both still um, completely virtual. And then we write a converter that uses two sources. So that's a bivariate function <coughs> um, that uses the value from source one and the value from source uh, from 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 uh, so called first it sets um, the output value to the value of um, of, of of this pixel, um, then it subtracts that pixel, and then because it's a distance of two, um, um, we also have to multiply by 0.5 so that we get a correct um, center gradient, um, uh, center pixel gradient, right? So that's it. Um, let's go back to the tutorial and let's see how this works. And then we can then we can show these gradient x and gradient y's. And what I'm doing here is a little I do a little bit more of um, big data viewer um, conveniences. Um, I'm showing I'm not only showing this, but I'm also storing a reference to the big data viewer and then changing the color of the source so that we can um, overlay them on top of each other doing 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 different colors. So, so let's let's see how this works. <clears throat> So there's a bunch of sources. You can see them here in the side panel. To move my uh, zoom overlay a little bit, so you see here, this is the original thing. Let's switch them all off and go into um, fused mode. And now we see um, two things. First of all, um, the gradient stuff seems to work, right? Um, so we have the magenta channel is the x gradient and the um, uh, green channel is the y gradient and the negative and positive so, so around here this is this is zero right so we can rotate this um, we have also seen that this thing built up as we as we zoomed as, as as we opened it right and the reason for this is that while i implemented this and why i didn't display this none of these gradients had ever been implemented never been calculated, right? So because because it's all lazy. Only at the moment when Big Data Viewer wants to show things, we actually start seeing them. And and then they're being calculated and then I'm using this um, cache mechanism um, to uh, to um, store intermediate versions from them. So you can see here that I'm using um, a cache on the gradient Y and a cache on the gradient X. So all these 32 um, by 32 um, pixel boxes are being filled. Okay. Next example. So this is a um, tutorial for what else we can. So wait a second. This was actually, well, this actually goes forward to the next um, section in the presentation that I want to show you. So I think I have to go to slide number nine. Um, when we're talking about so we've seen how, how we can use lazy evaluation and lazy pixel processing with image 2 so that's very convenient and now the question is um, and we've seen how to use caches to store stuff in main memory um, and reproduce it um, as necessary uh, when when um, main memory is not sufficient <clears throat> and of course you can use this to to load data on demand Right? So instead of generating it and calculating it, you can also load it from a, from a data backend. And so now we have to talk a little bit about data backends. Right? So the, the classic um, data backend for image analysis is um, two-dimensional images or n-dimensional images. And for two-dimensional images, we have a bunch of established formats, uh, JPEGs, PNGs, um, most important um, um, in the scientific community is probably the standardized TIFF format and also the uh, more modern um, HDF5 standard. Um, this is great, but it's inefficient for very large images. So if you have an image of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels and you store this in a single um, 2D image, which is a, a linearized, um, linearized representation um, in memory, and you compress this in order to load a small chunk of this data that you then want to process, you have to kind of decompress the entire thing, or you have a, I don't know, depending on your compression algorithm, you may jump forward in, in, in block sizes, but, but, it's, but it's sort of difficult. So it's, it's, it's not great. So what's a good solution for this? Um, you tile your image space. <clears throat> um, some um, um, established solutions implement this. For 
example, again, HDR5, uh, TIFF has a, has, a, has a tiled representation of, of images. And then there are these um, web-based standards um, that, that are uh, well-known. Google Maps, for example, is a pretty um, well-known um, standard for this that uh, stores 256 by 256 tiles. And you load only the tiles that you need, and they're independently compressed, so you don't don't ever have to um, access the entire data set. CadMate is using using a similar structure with Zoomify as well, so that's fine because when uh, we have small um, data sets, um, uh, a small access like this, we only have to load these tiles, and then we can um, focus on the pixels that we want to process. Um, how do we do this when we have more than two dimensions? Well, if you use um, TIFF or uh, Revis or um, um, MRC, you will see these, um, these series of 2D tiles. Uh, same problem, if you want to get a small box from this, you have to load all the tiles that are covered by the box. And this can be inefficient if the tile size is large. Um, and of course, you can use tiled images um, to do this, which gives you the same efficiency um, as, as mentioned before. Unfortunately, um, this is the place where your IT department gets a little bit angry about you. Because these tiles, if they're if they're small, then 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 you then you um, then you have a more efficient access. So, so you would like to make them as small as possible. So you have to load um, uh, little data, but it also means that you have that you start having billions of, of teeny tiny files on your file system, and that's not the thing that most file systems like, right? So so it would actually be better if instead of these two D tiles. Um, we would have um, 3D chunking or ND chunking. And again, this is something that is well supported in the HDF5 format and also in um, um, web services like Cloud Volume, Boss, or Divid. Um, some of them are very heavily focused on doing this only for 3D. Um, HDF5, however, would do this um, in N dimensions for you. And that gives you the opportunity to just load very um, small numbers of chunks for, for, for these data sets. So you've seen HDF5 mentioned on all of these slides <clears throat> very prominently because it's really great. And for anything that is not outrageously large, so, so well, let's, let's track back. HDF5, you should use HDF5 for almost everything you're doing because it um, allows you to have structured data in a single file container. You can link between um, file containers. <clears throat> you can associate um, structured, um, not structured, but, but, but at least type metadata. To, to, to your um, structured data sets in, these, in this container format. You can, you can have compression, you can have this chunking, you can have random access to these chunks. So this is fantastic. For several hundreds of gigabytes data sets, um, this is great. The only place where HDF5 uh, doesn't excel is, is in parallel writing of many chunks into a single data set. So assume you have a volume of 50 teravoxels and it's one volume. And you want to write many of these chunks into this into this single volume. This is where, where HDF5 is, is complicated because the chunks are uh, not a, the compressed chunks in particular are not aligned on a um, standardized um, step grid, but um, but are but are but are um, adjusted to to each other. And then uh, so, so so you can only sequentially write these these chunks out. Okay. So there's there are some uh, libraries that help you out with this and do at least parallel compression. <clears throat> and you then use some native layers in HDF5 to directly um, write into the, into the byte stream. Um, but so far, this doesn't work very well when you work on a compute cluster and you have independent um, computers talking to the same parallel file system, for example. <clears throat> so that's why we um, thought like we want to have everything that HDF5 has, um, but we want to make it simpler and use parallel file system capabilities to do parallel writing because that's what they're built for and, 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 and that's what they're good at. And that's why we ended up um, building the N5 API. Well, full disclosure, we started to implement a new format specification and then we found, um, uh, figured that it's silly uh, because you shouldn't invent new formats and realized that what we're, what we're trying to do here is actually just a programming API for some primitive um, access patterns that are um, consistent between um, file-based backends that write individual files um, onto the file system and also HDF5. So these primitives 
are that you want to be able to create, delete, and list groups and data sets in a hierarchically structured um, thing. So this hierarchical structure could be an HDF5 file, or it can be uh, a cloud storage, or it can be a file system, right? So say you, you want to read the, the, the tree of directories. <clears throat> um, you want to be able to create, delete, list, and read attributes um, for groups and data sets. So we want to store n-dimensional data sets or something that's related to this, and we want to store them in this hierarchy and we want to be able to um, assign metadata to each of these things. So this is not something that in the file system is, a, um, is, is standardized. Um, so we decided, okay, maybe we just write a JSON file into this and that's what we practically did for the, for the first implementation of this. Right? In HDF5, it would mean that you associate these metadata elements to, to individual groups or data sets. <clears throat> so what else do you want for the data sets? You want to implement chunks. Uh, you want to create, delete, read, uh, um, and create, delete, and read compressed data blocks. These are the, the chunks or, or cells in these data sets. <clears throat> and then for the first um, implementation of this, we created a file system backend that uses directories for groups, um, JSON files for the attributes, because that allows you to um, this, uh, express arbitrary, um, arbitrarily uh, structured data. And we use one file per data block. Um, hopefully this file is not too small and we um, implemented the standard compression algorithms that are available in, in, in standard libraries to um, to compress these things. Okay. So, okay. Um, uh, in addition, Stefan, yeah. uh, maybe if uh, I, I'm having a couple of questions uh, mm -hmm. about uh, like storing and accessing this n dimensional data with checks. Yeah. Um, how are the processing or analysis of structures uh, spanning neighboring tiles done? Um, if you have a connected component uh, occupying multiple tiles, I think this mm -hmm. is a problem that is uh, common for H5 and for N5, actually. It's yeah, so, so it depends on your processing algorithm. So what we, what we did for, for, a, for the COSAM project, where we um, used, used um, well, I'll, I'll actually get to this, but, but, but let's, let's answer it now. Okay. Um, so what you what you can do when you do connected components is you process the connected components in in, in, in chunks in parallel. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the chunks of your file system um, or or your data container, but something that is that is in, um, feasible for for your um, for your um, for your processing pipeline, and then um, you run over the connected components that touch each other. Um, in your extracted data structure and you make a union find over over these connected components and we re, um, relabel them um, with uh, with uh, with the adjusted um, um, label ID and if you follow some 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 primitive rules like you you enumerate so, so in your block processing you basically give label IDs for your connected components um, by using let's say the first um, the, the first pixel that you find that con that um, that belongs to the connected component, so, so you don't have any overlap in in, um, in in labels, and then you can do this union find over the adjacent blocks. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And I think Roko has had a question also. Roko, if you want to uh, speak, uh, yes, I would like to ask uh, Stefan and Pavel as well. Um, if you are on a plane and you have just two parachutes and there is the HDF5 format, N5, and TIFF, which format uh, you try to save. That means, you know, usually we acquire that set with a microscope that produces TIFF. And uh, of course, some file format, they are better for processing. So we may convert this data set into HDF5 or eventually other, but also we are presented with the problem to keep the raw data and you know if I have one terabyte of raw data and after I convert this in another format or eventually a third format um, what is the suggestion that you give about uh, which yeah. it, it, should it, keep yeah. it's a good set. A very Thank practical you. question yeah so my my proposal to everybody building a new microscope and deciding about a file format to store this in is HDF5. Use HDF5 directly for streaming out your data from your microscope. So HDF5 doesn't gives you gives you all the, the the beautiful things that you want from a good data format. You can you can um, define arbitrary metadata dialects, and you can later extend them. 
and it supports all sorts of types for your pixels that you that you can imagine um, streaming from your microscope. And you you don't have to resave it because you can immediately use it through um, through uh, APIs like the N5 API, for example. TIFF is not so great um, because it's um, it's meant it is built for 2D. Okay. Thanks. So use HDF5 for everything that is moderate in size. <laughs> yeah. And you get compression, right? So, so you can have arbitrary compression. So the data, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the first layer of data um, losslessly compressed is already smaller than, than if you store this in raw TIFFs or, or, or DAT files that are, that are of, of arbitrary um, structure. Okay, good. So let's, con let's, let's con continue here, here a bit. Um, um, we have bindings of this N5 library to ImageLib2, which allows us to um, transparently load these N5 containers um, through, through ImageLib2 and have them memory cached uh, in main memory. We have we use ImageLib2 cache for this. <clears throat> and we have support for some arbitrary um, adventurous things like um, pixel types that contain um, an unknown multitude of labels um, with, an, with an unknown um, weight. Okay. In addition to this, um, we have alternative backends and compressors. So N5 is just an interface API. So through this interface, um, which is used for, the, for from this image of two library, for example, um, we can we can have several backends. So we implemented two cloud backends for AWS S3 and, and, um, and Google Cloud. Um, we implemented a backend for HDF5. So you don't have to change your code when you change from this um, cloud storage stuff or, um, or um, file systems, single files backend um, into into um, actual HDF5 containers. That's why I'm suggesting use HDF5 if your data uh, is reasonably small because it's great for that. Um, we have a backend for ZAR. There's an unfortunate um, uh, dichotomy right now um, because backend and 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 um, type conversion is currently not separated in the N5 API. We'll work on that um, at a later time so that we can support Google Cloud and AWS transparently also for ZAR. Um, there are some forks. Um, in the wild, um, developed by um, Josh Moore and and and, and Tishi, uh, that implement this for part of the AWS support, but we actually want everything. <clears throat> ZAR is a very related um, 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 format to to the original N N5 um, file system specification. So, and then another cool thing is that you can um, um, add new compressors very easily to N5 um, by implementing some compressor interfaces and annotating them. And at, at runtime, the JVM explores all the available compressors in your uh, class path and makes them available to you. So we added uh, BLOST compression, which was important to support ZAR completely, and also some ex experimental uh, JPEG compression, which is good if you want to share data um, over the web. OK, last but not least, there's a bunch of tools out there. Um, and 5 utils contains um, command line tools to visualize data sets, browse them, and do something like unique or uh, copy. So if you want to copy, from HDF5 into a ZAR container, from um, N5 into an HDF5 container, you just say N5 copy from here to there, and you specify the data sets that you want to copy, and then it finds all the attributes and does everything right. Um, we also included it in Fiji, and you will see this later um, in the uh, more practical session. And uh, we have some utilities for parallel processing on a Spark cluster, which we will um, talk about, um, about a little bit later. OK, um, of course, all of this is available as Maven artifacts. If you want to um, write software, you need the dependencies and we uh, deposit the, um, well, the more established um, aspects of the N5 um, library on, um, on um, Maven Sci Java and the more experimental things on a, a local Maven repository that we're maintaining from, from the lab. OK, so and this brings me into a, a place where I want to mention the data that I'm showing you in the following examples is from this uh, fabulous um, COSAM project with all these great people. Um, now, as a Heinrich trained deep neural networks to predict um, a multitude over 30 of different organelles from fib SEM data. And here you can see a small snapshot of this. Um, see that the neural network knows what a plasma membrane is, what mitochondria and mitochondrial membranes are, what the R is, a uh, different cell here. I see the ribosomes denser here than there. OK, so we'll see some of this data in the um, follow-up examples. And so go back into um, the IDE. 
and go into N5 tutorial one. So N5 tutorial one is meant to show you how simple it is to open an N5 um, data set, which can also be an HDF5 data set, as I mentioned before, um, from in, in, in Java code, right? So here we say we have an HDF5 container, and this is one that sits on um, AWS um, on Amazon Cloud. And we want to open a data set in this N5 container. Right? So these are two things. That's the container, and this is the data set. This is also how HDF5 would work. So you have the surrounding HDF5 file, and then you have a data set that you point to. <clears throat> um, here I have a little convenience function that opens the write reader um, for various URL schemes. So it understands what an AWS, what a Google reader is, um, and what an HDF5 reader would be, and when, when it should use R and stuff like this. Right? So that's, that's a little helpful thing. Um, this creates me, oh Jesus, where did I jump? Uh, so this creates me an N5 reader, which is the interface for all of them. <clears throat> and then I'm using um, the N5 ImageLib2 library to open, um, again, an ImageLib2 data structure, which is um, something that is bounded. So it's an interval in uh, not real, but uh, discrete random access to an image. Um, and I open this from this container with this data set, and then I use the BDV functions as we've done before to show this. So let's see how this works. Uh, I'll probably complain that I'm currently not, in, not logged in into AWS, which I'm not. Um, but this is a public data set, so it'll be able to load stuff anyways. And now we can see um, data popping up here. There's a downscaled version of uh, one of these cells, right? So that's okay. So I can move this around and I can try to scroll through this, but you will also notice that, so now I'm trying to rotate this and it's like super stucky. This is not Zoom, this is me. That's terrible. And the reason for this is that we are currently uh, trying to load this data set lazily uh, from AWS, which um, accrues some, some latency and it takes some time to get this over the internet while I'm doing a Zoom call, right? Um, and this lazy loading is blocking. That's not good. It's good for processing because you need the pixels immediately, but it's not good for visualization. So um, the big data viewer front end has some um, gimmicks to improve this situation. So we changed this a little bit. Uh, we do the same thing here. We open a reader, and now we use um, a slightly different method here to open this data set that uses a backend um, that provides the opportunity to tell the, the consumer that grabs a pixel whether the pixel is actually there or not but it always gives you an answer. So it doesn't wait until the pixel is loaded, but it just returns you some crap value and tells you that this is not, not, not actually here. And this is super useful for visualization because you want to visualize stuff while you're trying to load things. And only once it's there, you want to actually display this, right? So we can use this for Big Data Viewer. We use a shared queue that uses several uh, available processors. So we're slowly approaching um, um, parallel processing of Big Data. And we show this uh, through a convenience method that wraps this image as a volatile data structure. So let's practically see how this looks. <clears throat> um, we get the same, so, so first it has to find the data set, right? And then we get big data view and you can see that I can immediately move things around and that the data is not necessarily there um, when I want to see it, but it drops in, right? And then because this is all memory cached, um, it keeps sitting in main memory. And once, it's, once, once it exists, I can, I can smoothly browse through this as pretty neat. So it's also not the highest resolution thing. When I'm interpolating this, it looks a little bit better. OK, cool. So next example. Um, what we can do with this is exactly the same as with the standalone ImageLib2 example that we've seen before. And I decided that we um, just do, do exactly the same thing. We load this data set, uh, we convert it into doubles. In this case, it's actually relevant because this is an unsigned type that comes in. Um, then we make three gradients because this is a 3D data set. And we show the three gradients with three colors in Big Data Viewer. Let's see how this works. We'll still have some time, that's good. You can already see that this is actually um, generating some stuff. So that's the original image that we may want to switch off. So we can see um, only the beautiful gradients. And here they are, three colors, one in X, one in Y, one in Z. And we can rotate things. And you can also see that we're using a slightly different cache size 
block size for the gradients that we're using for the incoming data set. The incoming data set has relatively large blocks, um, but the cache for the um, gradients is much, much smaller. Um, still, every gradient that needs to be calculated needs to wait for the big block to emerge. But once it's there, it's all relatively fast um, because it works through this, um, through this multi-threaded um, cache queue, right? Okay, so this is on the fly processing um, and caching um, of data in Big Data Viewer. Um, Stefan? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, sorry to, to interrupt. It's it's five o'clock. Um, I would like to know uh, what you still have to present, and uh, if you think that you will be done in like five to ten minutes. Yeah, I'm I'm trying. So I'm trying to go where I go in five mm -hmm. to ten minutes, and 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 I'll I'll stop in time. So, okay. okay. So then then we we continue for like maximum ten more minutes. So awesome. Thank Perfect. you. So now we have um, we have seen how we can visualize these things, but of course, uh, visualization is not the only thing that you um, that you that you that you want to do. Um, so here I have an example where we uh, load this data set, and then we um, we copy it. So so um, again, here we open the data set, uh, we read some attributes from this from this file, and then we um, copy into several output containers, right? So then we're measuring the time. Um, in this case, we um, generate. Um, and, and five file system writer um, with the ending and five. Here we generate a czar writer, and here we uh, generate an HDF5 writer, and we compare um, how these things um, um, compare uh, time wise. <clears throat> I will see something very, um, very surprising. So, first we copy to the N5 file system. And that takes a while. Twenty-four seconds. Let me copy to Czar. That was much faster. Five seconds. And then we copy to HDF five, which is also in the range of five seconds. So does that mean that the N five file system is slower than the Czar backend? Unfortunately, I can't hear you. So the answer is no. Um, we're saving the same data structure into N five FS and in Czar, and because this thing through this matching method is memory cached. Um, the, the time that we accrue from loading this stuff from Amazon, um, from Amazon Cloud um, is only spent once, namely when we're storing into the first data set and you can actually try it at home um, and interchange these things. And you'll see that the um, speed is very similar for, um, for um, Zarn and 5 because they're basically doing the same thing and for HDR5 as well. So now where does multi-threading become um, interesting? Um, this is, um, this um, fifth um, and five example, this is exactly the same code as the number four, um, except that we're now using an executor service, namely a pool of 10 threads that we're using to save these data sets. And we're doing this for all of them. So let's see what happens now. Um, my prediction would be that storing the, um, the um, first data set is probably not much faster because that's a little bit uh, IO limited um, through my internet connection. But the saving for the um, subsequent operations would be a little bit quicker. Well, OK, it was faster. So 12 seconds for the first one, 1.2 seconds for the next one. And then here we see something that is curious and that you should remember. Um, that was the motivation to go into this N5 business in the first place. Um, storing multi-threaded into HDR5, at least for the libraries that we are currently using, is not very particularly helpful because the um, compressors block each other. And so writing into the HDF5 file is basically exactly the same speed as if I, if I would do it single threaded. Um, but writing into a, a multi-threaded multi-file container uh, gets a lot faster when, you, when you're using um, several threads. And because AWS has a lot of latency, uh, we're actually benefiting from um, spreading the latency over several threads that load stuff. So even the loading time is a little bit quicker, right? Okay, so this, this also um, shows us that we can um, use a simple executor service and this N5 util safe method to parallelize workflows. Because what we've shown so far is something that uh, generated new data into an image lib2 container, right? And we can just save this image lib2 container, which is then calculated on the fly into an N5 output data set or an HDF5 output data set. 
and we benefit from multi um, multi uh, threading through this executor service. So in this case, we would use ten um, CPUs to um, to do the to do the job, and we only specify this at the very end. And this is actually what happens um, in this very last data set. Let me see if this is useful. No, it's actually it's actually what's happening in the lazy tutorials. Um, here we have um, several ops that are cell loaders that um, that implement the logic to fill the data for these individual cells, not with data, but with um, something that we process on the fly. The logic there is exactly the same because a cell is just an image lift to a random accessible interval, and you can fill this random accessible interval with whatever you please, like a filter or in this case, um, contrast correction. And we can also see um, that um, storing this stuff out is, is basically exactly the same as showing it. And so we can use multi-threading to, 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 um, to accelerate our operations. So since I'm running a little bit out of time and I have only five minutes left, <clears throat> I will skip the other examples. There is a link to the repository um, available um, in the chat or later um, um, under the YouTube video. And I want to go into um, the last um, part of this talk, which um, is this one. Um, how do we paralyze things on compute clusters? Um, we use Spark. Spark is um, a very well-established framework for parallelization. And um, the basic magic is that you, that you, um, that you paralyze by uh, splitting um, your, your data into a, into a so-called RDD, the um, Resilient Distributed um, Data Set. And these Resilient Distributed Data Sets are distributed by Spark for, um, over a cluster and can be processed in parallel. And they can do joins and all sorts of interesting things. Um, however, in our scenario, the data is usually too big for Spark to um, exchange the data because the, it faces the same problem that the data has to fit somewhere in, in main memory, right? And so what we what we do is we, we basically generate RDDs that only define the, the, the block grid um, in which we want to process. And then inside um, every, every processing function, every map function inside this block grid, we generate the entire data set as I've shown you earlier, um, lazily. So we don't actually do it, we just generate the metadata. <clears throat> and, then, and then tell uh, the processing pipeline which little block to process. And then whether to save this block or, or, or um, um, accumulate it um, with, with other results. So you could do um, these, these aforementioned components, for example, you can do contrast correction filters and, and, and all sorts of other things. Um, what's great with Spark is that it has this implicit data parallelism and full tolerance. So on clusters, uh, one thing that always happens is that individual nodes die or don't do the job because computers fail occasionally, right? They fail rarely, but if you use very many of them, uh, one of them always fails. And Spark is built to deal with this, so you don't have to, which is, which is wonderful and we, we, we need this um, um, desperately. So we care not so much about this implicit data parallelism, but about the full tolerance. Um, and yeah, I, I talked about um, how you split these uh, workflows into, um, into, into these, these grids of processing units, and then in these processing units, just ramp up the entire thing um, and, and work from this. And another cool thing with Spark is that you can run it on not only our local cluster, but also on um, AWS or Google Cloud, for example. And I have to admit that I was um, lazy because I'm always using the Janelia cluster. And John yesterday um, did us the favor and show uh, ran a workflow on AWS, and he recorded a little bit of a of a, of a screenshot video how he uses AWS as console um, to start an EMR cluster, and then um, run run a small Spark job on it um, that you can see here. So this is um, so he's loading the the the, the jar file, the, the compiled source. And then he provides a few arguments to the source, um, what, it's, what it's supposed to do. This is the source of the N5 container or data set and blah, blah, blah. This is application specific. And he's using um, um, Amazon's um, step function to um, concatenate two Spark jobs that are um, independent. So this is the second one. The first one would do contrast correction on a data set. The second one would generate a scale parameter um, of the data set. And um, then he decides how many nodes he wants and that he wants to terminate after the cluster runs. 
and that is basically it. Right. So, and then in order to show you a small a glimpse into one of these um, into one of these jobs, I have here a small Spark tutorial where you can see how this works in practice. So, first of all, you create your Spark context. Um, then you want to do some global processing before before the, the whole parallelization goes on. Um, you need you need a reader. You need to read some 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 input data sets. You create an output in this case, right? Um, then you generate. You use a convenience function to generate the um, the metadata for the for the block grid that you that you want to generate. This goes into a, to a list. Then you make this list into an RDD. This RDD is then the structure. This this resilient distributed data set that can be distributed by Spark um, across as many um, compute nodes um, as necessary. And then you run the actual code. And this is down here. And in the actual code, you see that for every grid node, every metadata of a grid block in this data set, we do the following. We create the complete data set. We create a new N5 reader. Um, we run, we, we open the full image. Then we do contrast correction um, using some, some um, stack, some, some local cell loaders, right? We crop the block of interest and then we write it out. And if we run this, so we actually have to run this with um, a bunch of command line parameters that you will see here. So you can run this locally on my local laptop. I have only four CPUs, so I'm running a Spark cluster of four CPUs, it's not so much. And then input parameters. And then you can run this. Uh, Spark generates a little bit of output. Um, and then um, it also provides you a web interface where you can watch how it works. And here you can see, okay, this is a, the for each job that Spark is running and it's currently doing some work. And um, it should be finished in very little time. So the first few things, because it's a relatively small data set, so four CPUs are, are a good test ground for this, right? And then, then, then you can, can see it finishing at some point. And then we have a contrast corrected data set. Okay, and with this, because my time is over, um, I want to um, close the presentation with um, a, an advertisement to that we also developed this cool tool, Pantera, which uses N5 extens extensively. Um, Pantera works again. The last time I presented it, we had a problem with Java 8. Uh, now it works on Java 11. Um, and I want to um, thank everybody um, who helped me with this, particularly the lab, um, people that have been in the lab before, and all the fabulous people at Janiel and elsewhere have generated this massive um, uh, data, and everybody who is in this open source community and um, it's, it's, um, um, helps us um, developing, developing code. All right, and with this, I and share my screen and stop. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you a lot, Stefan, for your uh, presentation. That was really great. Um, I would have one question and then we wrap up. Uh, in which cases would you go for like solutions like AWS, uh, Spark, and in which solution, uh, in which cases would you go for like local cluster solutions? Is it a question of accessible resources or like size of the data? It's accessible resources. It's, okay. I think it's accessible resources. So AWS costs money, right? Um, mm -hmm. As does Google Cloud. Um, oftentimes a local compute cluster, if you have one at your institution, is, is, is a little bit more affordable. Um, there is also the, the wow. proximity of data. Um, if you if you store your data, so also storing data in the cloud is expensive. Um, yeah. So if you want to if you want to store your data locally, you should also process it locally. If you plan to process it on AWS or Google Cloud, you should put it up once, then process it there and not move it back and forth all the time because this costs extra money, right? Mm. Um, and and then and then stay there for for as long as it takes. And, and only consume the result or even never return it. So, so the cool thing for this COSAM project, for example, is that we got a very sweet deal from AWS because we provide this data publicly. Um, they don't charge for, for, for the public data um, that, is, that, is, that is accessible to the, to the web. So that's awesome. It's not, not a general thing, but you can apply for this. 
and if you have um, if you have data that you want to share with people, um, there are there are ways to to, um, to 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 get it for free or for for um, for no money. Okay, so you you would recommend AWS solution when there is no access to a cluster solution. Yes. So okay. the, the nice thing with the commercial cloud providers is that you that you don't pay pay for the maintenance of the cluster. Right? So if yeah, you that's true. if what you're doing uh, happens uh, once in a while, um, then then you go for a, for a commercial provider um, mm. because they cost more in the moment, but but then you don't pay anything else for the rest of the year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, and thank you also again, uh, Pavel. It was really great. Uh, it's time to uh, end up this webinar on big data. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I would like to remind all the attendees to fill the survey for uh, new bias. Um, yes, thank you very much and see you maybe next time.